So in this section, we'll be looking at supervisors. Now, in Erlang, you know, there are two types of errors, predictable and unpredictable ones. Uh, predictable errors include um, incorrect user input or maybe looking up data which doesn't exist. And you tend to handle these errors by returning error tuples and manage them in your program. Now, it's unpredictable errors which are the hard ones. Um, they include errors you know, such as arising as a result of a corrupt state or you know, maybe as a bug in your code. And the problem with unpredictable errors is that we will not know what these unexpected, you know, what they will be until they've actually occurred. You know, we could speculate on what these bugs are uh, and you know, go in and start implementing our own error handling and recovering strategies. And you know, this is usually a bad idea. It will increase the complexity of your code, it will make it you know, immaintainable, and more, most likely only handle you know, a fraction of the issues which can arise. So, you know, after all, you know, how can you handle a bug if you don't know what that bug is? Uh, you know, using automated generation tools, um, you know, based on probability-based testing such as Quick and Proper, you know, can certainly help failure scenarios and test edge cases you know, that you would otherwise never come up with on your own. But you know, that's usually not enough. And you know, this is where uh, the generic supervisor behavior module uh, makes its entrance. What it does is, you know, it takes over the responsibility for all of the unexpected errors and recovery strategy from the developer and puts it in the hands of the system architect. So if we think of you know, any Erlang-based system, uh, you know, fault tolerance is achieved by creating what we call supervision trees, where in a supervision tree, the supervisors are the nodes uh, and the workers are the leaves. Um, in the Erlang world, we tend to show uh, processes which are trapping exits with a double ring, and more often than not, they are supervisors. And you know, supervisors on a particular level will handle the children in the subtree uh, they're, they're supervising. And you know, children of a supervisor can either be other supervisors or worker processes. In our example, it's only, uh, only the supervisors which are trapping exits, but you know, there's nothing stopping workers from doing the same. Now, building systems in layers is what makes, uh, makes it robust. Uh, we're, we try to isolate an error in the worker, and if we fail, the worker terminates, the supervisor will go in and handle that issue. And a supervisor, you know, on a particular level, will, will, you know, will trap and fix errors occurring in its subtree. So, you know, in a well-designed system, you know, application programmers will not have to worry about all these unexpected errors, as they're all isolated in the higher levels of the system. And let's go ahead and look and see how we actually do it in Erlang. So, supervisors, you know, we've said that supervisors monitor children. It's also the responsibility to, uh, to start them. So, Erlang systems consist of one or more supervision trees. And it's a supervisor which goes in and starts all of its child processes. Now, as we mentioned earlier, you know, children can be workers or other supervisors. Now, it's a supervisor's responsibility to trap exits and link itself to the children. So this is why in our GenServer example, we were actually calling GenServer start link. If the supervisor terminates, you know, also the children will be terminated. And if the child terminates, the supervisor will receive an exit signal and take appropriate action. Now, this action will vary from supervisor to supervisor based on a configuration. Now, try to picture you know, a supervisor implementation. You maybe have implemented one. You might have seen examples in, you know, online or in books. Now, if you think of a supervisor implementation just like a generic server, we're able to break it up into you know, specific parts and into generic parts. So things such as you know, spawning the supervisor, registering it, um, you know, will be generic. Spawning the supervisor and registering will be the same, irrespective of what the children, uh, the supervisor starts or monitors do. Uh, monitoring the children and restarting them uh, when they terminate abnormally is also generic, as is you know, stopping the supervisor and terminating all of the children. You know, what will be specific in a uh, supervised implementation are you know, what children are actually started, how does the supervisor behave when the children terminate? You know, will it go in and restart the children? 
Will the supervisor itself terminate any other children which are part of that supervision subtree? Or maybe only some of them? Or yeah, possibly even none? And how many restarts will we allow you know, the, the, the workers and other supervisors in sub subtree uh, to, you know, to how, many, how many restarts will we allow to take place before the supervisor itself decides that just by restarting them it's not solving the problem and decides to terminate and escalate the problem over to its top level supervisor. So in OTP, uh, uh, the generic supervisor behavior model is called, surprisingly enough, supervisor. It will contain all of the generic code. Uh, the callback module will have you know, whatever name you want it to have. Uh, in our example, we're calling it calc sub. And what we need to do is have uh, the behavior supervisor directive included in the module itself. So the callback module usually also provides a function used to start uh, the supervisor itself, so you know, a client function. Uh, we start using supervisors using the start link function and you know, provide an optional supervisor name. We provide uh, the callback module and the arguments we want to pass to the init callback function. This will spawn a new process, uh, the supervisor process, which goes in and calls init. Init will initialize the supervisor state and it will return a specification you know, which contains a list of static children, so the children we want the supervisor to start, as well as configuration uh, on how to handle abnormal termination of these children. So let's go in and look at how um, the supervisor specification looks. It's a tuple you know, which contains two elements. Uh, the first will tell the supervisor how to handle the dependencies among children, as well as the maximum number of restarts allowed in the supervision subtree within max time seconds. The second element of uh, the tuple is a list of child specifications and which you know, provide information on how to start and stop the various children. So let's look at these values in more detail, you know, starting with the restart tuple. Um, the, restart tuple, the restart tuple well, will contain a restart type, and it's one of the following strategies. It could be a one-for-one -one strategy, and that means that only the crashed process will be restarted. Uh, the strategy is ideal if you know, workers don't depend on each other, and the termination of one process will not affect all the others. So imagine a supervisor monitoring uh, the, the worker process that controls you know, instant messaging sessions of hundreds of thousands of users. If any one of these processes crashes, you know, we lose the session for that particular user, but we don't want to affect all the other users running in the system. All other workers, well, in, in such a scenario, should continue running independent of each other, you know, possibly receiving a status down, you know, that this user has disconnected and then a status up when this particular session is restarted. In the one-for-all strategy, if a process terminates, uh, all processes are terminated and restarted. And this is, strategy, this is a strategy used if all or most of the processes in the subtree depend on each other. If a process terminates, you know, we'll want to terminate them all and then restart them one by one, uh, hoping that you know, whatever caused the issue will have been repaired. And finally, you know, we've got the rest for one strategy. In the rest for one strategy, all processes started after the process are terminated and restarted. And we tend to use this strategy if, if, you're, if, you're process, if you start your processes in order of dependency. Now there's one last strategy we've not covered and it's a simple one for one. We use it for, you know, for children of the same type which we add dynamically at runtime, so not at startup. Now the last two elements in the restart tuple are max restart and max time. You know, max restart will specify the maximum number of restarts all child processes are allowed to do in max time seconds. If maximum number of restarts is reached you know, in this number of seconds, the supervisor realizes that it's not been able to solve the problem. It terminates itself and escalates the termination to its higher level supervisor. You know, what is in effect happening is that you know, we're giving the supervisor max restart chances to solve the problem. And if crashes still occur in max time seconds, well, that means that the problem has not been solved. So 
hopefully the supervisor above it, by restarting its subtree or some of its processes, will, you know, will be able to manage it. So in this example, um, if you know, the lowest subtree has a maximum restart of one, if a process crashes, uh, it has had one restart. If there's a new restart, the supervisor itself terminates and its top level supervisor will get a max restart of one. We get a new termination, max restart of the bottom supervisor goes to one, it terminates again, the max restart of the middle supervisor goes up to two, it terminates himself. Now, the top level supervisor will always have a max restart of zero, so this whole subtree will terminate. And upon termination, you know, something else usually tends to happen. Either the supervision tree is restarted, or the actual node itself, the whole node itself, is restarted. So the, the key to supervision, supervisors, is to ensure that you have properly designed your restart strategy. So you need to cater for abnormal terminations, and you know, even though you will never be able to fully predict what will cause your processes to terminate, you can always try to design your restart strategies you know, to recreate the process state from you know, good known sources. You know. And this is, instead of you know, going in and actually storing the state persistently, assuming that it's not corrupted, and you know, rereading it from uh, the database or whatever persistent medium you used when restarting the process. And you know, the best point, you know, as an example, you, know, you go in and you read uh, some data from a device board, Maybe you know, what could have happened is that reading the data when transmitting it over to the process might have gotten corrupted and you didn't notice, you tried to do something with it, it terminates. So the process terminates, upon restarting you go back and you reread it from this device board. Hopefully at that point the transmission won't be corrupted and you will get back the right value and you know, the whole process is able to continue running. So the next argument in the tuple is a list of one or more child specifications. The child specification contains all of the information the supervisor needs to start, stop, and delete its child processes. Uh, the specification is a tuple with six elements. Uh, we have the name. Uh, it's an identifier which has to be unique for a particular supervisor. You've got the start function, which is a tuple of the former module function arguments. Now, this function has to call the start link function in your behavior. Uh, you cannot add pure Erlang processes to OTP supervision tree. They have to be OTP behaviors or special processes. The restart type will tell the supervisor how to react when a child, termina when a child terminates. So um, if we, for example, pick permanent, it means the child will always be restarted, irrespective of if the reason for termination was normal or abnormal. Transient means that we will restart the child only after normal non-exit. So, if the child terminates normally, it will not be restarted. Well, it's temporary means that the child is never restarted, irrespective of if the termination is normal or not. Now, the next um, argument in the child specification tuple is shutdown time. Shutdown time is the maximum time the behavior will be allowed to spend in its terminate callback function uh, before the supervisor will step in and unconditionally terminate the child. We don't want, when we want to take down a supervision tree, we don't want a child hanging in its terminate function, maybe you know, trying to access some remote device which it can't get to. So this is a positive integer, you know, denoting the time in milliseconds or the atom infinity. Now you should be using infinity only if your child is a supervisor. You know, shutdown time can also be brutal kill. That means that you know, when the supervisor goes in and terminates the children, it won't be allowed to execute in the terminate function. And then we've got process types. Uh, process types and modules are used for software upgrade. You need to tell the supervisor you know, if the child is a supervisor or another worker and which modules are actually implementing the child. Um, modules are often, more often than not, uh, callback modules and possibly some other modules the callback module might be dependent of in case of an API change. And what happens is when we go in and do a coordinated software upgrade in Erlang, the supervisor will go in and know which processes to suspend and which processes to resume whilst the code upgrade is, be is, is, is happening. We won't cover it in this masterclass, but I think there are a lot of tutorials and you know, a lot have been said and written about 
software upgrades using OTP. So here's an example of our calc supervisor. Our calc supervisor is started using the start link function. The start link function takes the environment uh, variable we need to pass to calc and it calls supervisor start link. We register the supervisor locally with the name calcsup. The callback module is calcsup and we pass in uh, the environment variables which get passed on to uh, the init callback function. Now in the init callback function we um, you know, create, we, we initialize our supervision flags and create our child specifications. In our supervision flags, we see that you know, this restart strategy we've picked is the one for one. That means that if a process terminates, only that process will be restarted. We allow a maximum of 10 restarts per hour. Note that uh, this is the only place where we actually give time in seconds instead of milliseconds. So uh, the maximum restart time is in seconds. And finally, we've got a child specification. We, the unique identifier uh, of this child in the supervisor is calc. We start our, super, our, our behavior using calc start, passing in an environment variable. Note also here how we're passing start, but calc start actually calls gen server start link. So it's a gen server's responsibility to link itself to the supervisor. We want this child to be permanent, so irrespective of how it's stopped, um, we need to be able to restart it. Upon termination, we give it a maximum of two seconds, and in case we want to do software upgrade, we state that it's a worker implemented in the calc module. And we go in and we return the tuple OK, uh, we return the supervision flags, and the list with the child specification back to the supervisor, and the supervisor goes in and starts synchronously, uh, we'll go in and start synchronously each children in the child specification list. And once all of the children have been started, the supervisor's start link will return OK PID. If any child were to terminate uh, in the startup procedure, it will, the, the supervisor will go in and terminate all the children and terminate itself. So the startup phase may not fail whatever happens. So none of the children in the startup phase may fail. In this section, we've looked at the generic supervisor module, including restart strategies and static children. What we have not covered, however, are dynamic children. So the ability of a supervisor to start and stop uh, children during runtime once it started. And we've also not covered the simple one-for-one -one strategy. And this is a strategy which is often associated uh, with dynamic processes, especially when we've got many dynamic processes of the same time, which come and go during runtime. OK, so this is it for supervisors. In the next section, we will look at how to package a supervision tree into a building block uh, called an application. Mm -hmm.